All right, so uh, we have got uh, day five of uh, PFT 109 today. So we're looking at uh, chapter five here in the, or I'm sorry, not chapter five, chapter, shoot, eight of the um, uh, senior manual today. So um, this is going to cover uh, core training, balance training, and reactive training for fall prevention. Now, this is all sort of like lumped up into one big chapter here, um, but it does mean that as we're looking at it, uh, we are basically going to be analyzing um, uh, the movement prep section, right? The, the core, the balance, the reactive stuff uh, within an OPT template, right? So the senior stuff isn't necessarily going to go through SAQ. Um, it'll kind of just roll from, from the warm-up stuff that we already covered with flexibility and cardio, now into the core balance and reactive sections, right? So uh, you might remember how I mentioned uh, the CEX tem uh, uh, continuum, right? So, um, you know, when it comes to normal program design as like standard personal trainers, we always break it down and we're just like, look, you got to turn your overactive stuff off. You got to turn your underactive stuff on stretch the tight muscles, strengthen the weak muscles, right? And it's pretty basic. Um, well, NASM took that concept and they, they, they spread it out and made it a little bit more complex in the ideas, uh, in, in the corrective exercise certification. So NASM has this thing and they call it the CEX continuum, corrective exercise continuum. Uh, and basically they just took that idea and and expanded it to make it a little bit more specific right and so it kind of looks like this right um when you look at it, it's just, it's a sort of a four-step technique and we, we talked about this in class and i think i mentioned on friday briefly but um you basically in you start with inhibit then you move over to lengthen then you move over to activate and then you move over to integrate uh, eventually they put arrows in this which i think helps uh but uh when it comes to inhibiting right we're going to use inhibitory techniques like self myofascial release foam rolling um massage guns things like that and inhibit any overactive muscles then we are going to lengthen we're going to use lengthening techniques on those overactive muscles now and for now we're just going to say static stretches fall into that category but when you get into most class he'll also teach you neuromuscular stretching which is also an inhibitory technique uh, or well a lengthening technique so we start with inhibiting and lengthening in our overactive muscles and then we switch over to these two sections here where we're going to go into the activating and integrating sections so in a normal opt template we would just sort of you know move through inhibiting and then lengthening and then we would get into the workout where we generally try to target any of their overactive muscles and stuff right um but here you can see we're getting really specific about activation uh by using specific activation techniques one of those is positional isometrics that's another thing that mo's going to teach you that we're not necessarily covering in the standard edition but eventually we get into isolated strengthening isolated strengthening just means you're going to work the muscle by itself to get it turned on okay so like an isolated strength let's say like i had arms falling forward, but I only had it on one side, right? Like I had a, a little bit of like asymmetry there. I might do like an isolated strengthening technique to activate that arm, right? Uh, and that's all isolated strengthening means. It means you're just doing something all by itself to kind of get it turned on. Um, and then eventually we're gonna integrate stuff in our final step here, once the muscle is nice and turned on, we're going to teach that muscle how to work with the entire body. So now, if it's that underactive, let's say rhomboid muscle or something, right? Uh, well, I'll do like a reverse lunge, which has nothing to do with the rhomboids, into a cable row where I have to use everything all together. And that means it's sort of integrated with the rest of the body, right? So it's like we, turn the overactive stuff off in these two sections here. And then we turn the underactive stuff on and teach it how to work with the whole body over on the other side, right? And that's the corrective exercise continuum. That's what corrective exercise is really gonna be. So if you look at like what we've been doing until now, right? We talked about the flexibility stuff. That's, you know, we did flex, oops. <laughs> we did flexibility and cardio. Um, 
you know, uh, on Friday, right? We talked about the how to stretch stuff and how to do a little bit of cardio to get the body like nice and warm and stuff. That covers like when you're writing your OPT template, you know, you do a little bit of like SMR work in the beginning and then you stretch out afterwards. So you have got half of the CEX continuum already figured out. The only difference is this neuromuscular stretching is the, the sort of more advanced stretching techniques that, that Mo's going to teach you. Like um, Thomas, have you ever done the thing where uh, when someone's stretching you and then you contract against them and then they stretch you a little further? Uh, you ever do yeah. that? Mm -hmm. that, okay that's neuromuscular stretching so that's mo's going to teach you guys how to do those um like what the protocols are and like where to place your hands and stuff like that uh mm -hmm. in in his corrective exercise class so that is uh something that will will come in the future okay uh, but yeah for now imagine this doesn't exist but now it's just this section here we've already covered that right so as we're getting into core balance and reactive stuff, I want you to think of it as the activating slash integrating section. Um, this is where we are addressing our underactive muscles. So, you know, we look at our guy, Bob, uh, and I haven't actually looked at Bob's workout today. So I actually, God dang it, my camera's not focusing. Um, I haven't actually looked at Bob's workout today, um, but, uh, you know, we remember that he has like a little bit of a foot turnout problem. He has those tight calf muscles and he has a little bit of an anterior pelvic tilt problem. Um, so we are working on like loosening up his hip flexors, loosening up his low back, loosening up his calves. Well, now I'm going to look at exercises that are hopefully going to strengthen all of the antagonists to those muscles, right? If it was his foot hip flexors that were loose, what do I need to strengthen? His glutes. If it were his uh, erector spinae that was loose, what do I need to strengthen? I flipped to the other side, his transverse abdominis. If it was his calves, I flipped to the other side, it's his anterior tibialis. Uh, and we'll see if I'm right. <laughs> or we'll see if past me agrees. <laughs> um, but I haven't looked at that workout in a while. So, um, but that is how we would approach it when we're picking our core balance and reactive stuff. So those are the types of exercises we're going to focus on today. We're going to focus on uh, learning how to activate the right muscles at the right time uh, for the right amount of force, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so um, our objectives today, we want to talk about, oh, and then, ugh, and then one thing that this booklet, uh, the, the senior manual puts a little bit of special emphasis on uh, is talking about like, you know, the idea of building a program for fall prevention, you know, um, one of the biggest things that we're trying to, to do in senior clients is just keep them nice and upright, keep them walking so that they don't feel like you're sort of prisoners in their own home. You know, I, I had a client, uh, I think I, I talked about um, Maggie, who uh, basically couldn't go upstairs anymore. She couldn't like get up a flight of stairs. Um, and so she had moved into her guest room. And so like we built up her balance, we built up her core strength, we built up her endurance um, and eventually like got her to a place where she could do stairs again, you know? Uh, and that was something that took, I mean, that was a, like a year long journey, you know? Um, but it was very much worth it. That's, that's the kind of quality of life that she was looking for in a personal trainer. So that's the idea behind like senior clients, right? Is, is we are putting a little bit of emphasis on, you know, preventing fall stuff. So now it's, we've got sort of two things to focus on. Yes, we are going to work on our over, underactive muscles and try to get those turned on. Uh, but even part of that is like, okay, well, what kind of stuff can I do that's going to help somebody strengthen their core and strengthen their ability to balance so that they don't feel like they're going to, you know, uh, not be able to walk in a couple of years. So fall prevention is going to be huge. Um, you know, and the idea here is that we're going to talk about like the rationale behind uh, preventative programming, uh, programming, <laughs> um, you know, talking about fall prevention. Uh, <laughs> uh, core balance and reactive training, how to progress that and, and how to actually write those programs. So uh, just a couple statistics on falling here. You guys know how much NASM loves to throw statistics at the beginning of a chapter. Uh, <laughs> they make good test questions. Um, so uh, obviously falling is a very serious risk factor. There's about 1.8 million 
ER visits every year. Uh, this is back in 2005, by the way. So this is a very outdated statistic. I'm sure that is much, much higher at this point. Uh, 16,000 deaths related to falling, um, where, you know, someone will fall and then uh, they just won't be able to get up. They won't be able to get to the phone. Um, it's a very, very common thing in this country uh, and really everywhere, uh, just as we get older. Uh, but what we see, one of the very interesting statistics that we see here, and one of the reasons we want to avoid falling so, so much, um, uh, is that, uh, you know, one out of four people, and this is what's kind of crazy about this, right? One out of four people, that's about 25%, will pass away within one calendar year after sustaining like a hip fracture. That's a crazy, crazy, crazy statistic. What is going on my freaking camera? Today? This is driving me crazy. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> um, but one out of four, 25% of people like from, from hip fractures. Now, a lot of people think that like, you know, you could, you could make the argument. It's like, oh, well, a hip fracture is very painful. Maybe that's what's causing this. But really, it is related to how painful it is. But there's nothing. I mean, your femur is also where you make a lot of your red blood cells. But like, there's nothing that special about like that bone in particular. So why is it that a hip injury, a femur injury is so severe? Well, it's where, you know, if we look at like hip fracture, we're not talking about like the pelvis, although that would also be very, very, very painful. We're talking about like this area right in here, right? Where the femur is inserting onto the pelvis. Um, this is a very, okay, well, that's that's a full comp. That's about as bad as it gets. Um, but like, we're talking about this whole section right here. Now, the reason that's such a big deal and so painful is because like, this is your support for literally everything when it comes to walking. And we know that walking is so, 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 so good for us. So when someone breaks a hip, they slow down, they stay in bed and that, sedentary lifestyle is basically what kills us really, 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 really rapidly. Um, and that's why it's so important to make sure that we can keep our clients upright as much as we can, because we are trying to prevent them, you know, from becoming sedentary because sedentary is, is, you know, it's a big killer. Um, so uh, this is one of the reasons why we are going to, you know, lo look at all the, the risk factors here, right? There's a lot of risk factors related to, you know, increasing your client's chances of like falling. Um, a lot of them are intrinsic, but there also are some extrinsic factors there as well. Intrinsic factors are things that are happening sort of like in the body, right? lack of proprioception, uh, loss of balance, right? All of those nervous system changes that we talked about, but some of it can be extrinsic as well. Like the choices that your client is making, right? Um, like I know that like the goal is to retire on a beach somewhere, but like maybe walk to that beach. You know what I mean? Like, that's why I told my parents, I, I, I used that line of my parents a little while ago. I was like, I was like, you know, yes, we want to get you to a place where you can retire and you can relax, but I also want you to, you know, uh, I want you to be the iron nun, you know what I mean? Like I want, I want to, you know, the, those extrinsic choices, the lifestyle decisions that we're making absolutely affect us as well. We want to stay as upright and active as possible. Um, so, uh, and a lot of those risk factors are preventable with proper exercise, you know, like we talk about those intrinsic factors like proprioception and balance. Those are things that we can train for, you know, those are things that we develop over time. Um, so, uh, we definitely know that like, you know, the stronger we can strengthen our clients, the more, the less likely they are to fall, the less likely they are to fall, the less likely they are to deal with mortality problems related to, you know, sedentary lifestyles. So, um, when it comes to fall preventions, we are going to do that timed up and go assessment, the tug test that we talked about. Um, that is a really valuable assessment uh, for our senior clients because it's a good way to sort of identify our client's risk of falling. Now, in the manual and stuff, we don't necessarily look too uh, much, at, you know, like there's a lot of um, sort of protocols in the way that like certain health clubs will do this, you know, like they'll say the timed up and go test starts with your hands on a chair, for instance. We actually don't necessarily have to be that specific about it, but it is going to be, they're going to sit in a chair uh, and there's going to be a cone three meters away. Um, so that's about 10 feet, by the way. Uh, and they'll get up out of that chair, walk around the cone, and then sit back down. 
So we are going to, you know, during this assessment, um, we're going to perform this multiple times. And if their times get faster and faster and faster and faster, that's showing us improvement in the same way that like, if I tested how fast you can run a mile or if I tested, God, it's getting worse. Uh, if I tested, um, if I tested how, uh, what your heart rate is at the end of a three minute step test or a Rockport walk test, or if I tested, you know, how high you can jump, we're just comparing your beginning numbers to your ending numbers. Um, and as we, we sort of see those improvements, um, uh, you know, <laughs> um, it, it means that our client is at less risk of falling. Less risk of falling means, you know, less risk of mortality. Um, so even with senior clients, though, you know, we are going to use the OPT model. It doesn't matter if it's a senior client, doesn't mean it matter if it's a youth or an athlete or whatever. NASM's OPT model is really great because it gives us a super structured set of rules, but it is also very flexible. Um, so it can be used to address core balance and reactive training. And that movement prep section could be a full workout for your senior clients, right? Uh, like this is normally the section where, you know, in a sort of normal adult uh, athlete, right? Uh, we use this, this sort of movement preparation section as sort of a post warm up pre workout section to our overall workout. You know, like I might have like leg day on here, right? But I do like a, um, you know, for me actually, like this is, this is actually what I legitimately do. Uh, on heavy powerlifting days where I'm doing uh, leg stuff, um, if I'm doing the squat or the deadlift, either of those two movements, I will always do a McGill big three for a couple sets um, before I go into those movements. So I will do a McGill uh, sit up. I will then do a, uh, a bird dog and then I'll do a side plank. And I will often do a little bit of, of balancing as well. Um, so I'll do a little bit of like uh, uh, balance work where I'll do like single leg uh, squat touchdowns as like a way of sort of activating my glutes a little bit. So, you know, and this is the thing, this is where I'm obviously stepping outside of what NASM is gonna say. NASM is gonna say core and balance training and reactive training. You know, if you're doing a barbell squat, that's very much a strength movement. And these are very much stabilization uh, core workouts. But that is, you know, where, you know, as we get more advanced about this stuff, we can sort of start blending things together. But that's, that's the approach that I take. But I always do just a little bit of this stuff before I barbell squat. And it has made a huge difference because when it comes to squatting, uh, I would always get back pain. Um, I have a real bad habit of tucking my butt as I get into like deep ranges of motion. Uh, and that has made a, that has helped me make huge improvements um, because it gets all of my stabilizing core muscles turned on before I even get into the bar. Um, so I, I only wanted to mention that obviously those are, I'm blending a little bit of like stabilization core stuff with balance strength stuff. Um, Thomas, I'll bet, you know, you, you might, recognize the the differences between those two um and that is something you can do however when we teach this stuff we often teach it in isolation it's like look you get a strength client you do strength exercises you get a stabilization client you do stabilization exercises you know um but let's look at the example of like you know what if you had a client who is is bench pressing right um we know that's a strength routine because the bench press falls under the strength level right uh, but what if they have really bad rounded shoulders? Well, we know that static stretches are kind of the best way to loosen things up. I would still probably do a static, you know, chest stretch, even though I'm doing a heavy bench press strength routine. That's the exception to the rule, right? Um, because like overactive muscles, I care more about his posture than I care about how much weight he can lift. Is it going to reduce his strength a little bit? Because that's what static stretches do, which is why we normally avoid them in the strength level. Is that going to happen? Yeah, probably. Um, but I'm going to prioritize posture over weightlifting any day of the week, you know, um, or safety any day of the week. So, uh, man, I can't believe, like, I've, I've definitely dealt with, like, my camera being unfocused before, but I've never seen it last this long and it's driving me insane. <laughs> I don't know why it's bothering me so much, but it bothers the hell out of me. Uh, <laughs> all 
All right, so let's um, let's look at uh, some of this core training stuff, right? So um, when it comes to writing a core training program, right, we are still going to break this down using NASM's OPT model. So if we look at the OPT model here, we pull it up, right? Uh, we can see we've got the stabilization level, strength level, and power level. We're still going to use that here, but now we are going to start throwing specific exercises in specific categories based on this OPT model. So uh, let me check Canvas, actually. I don't think it was up there today. In fact, I know that it wasn't because I just looked at it. Uh, yeah, uh, I need to do that. Let me do that right now, actually. So I'm going to put the exercise checklists up here uh, just so we can have them. Uh, OK insert the link here. So these exercise checklists, right, are, are super helpful um, because they are uh, full of all of the exercises for the specific categories. Now the freaking camera focuses finally. I had to complain about it more. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, handouts. Where's the general handouts? Um, Mm, you know, I'm just going to add them all right now. Is that going to work? Nope. <laughs> Try that one more time. Let's see if I can drag it here. No, that does not work. OK, I will deal with this later. <laughs> um, so the exercise handouts, right? The, the exercise checklist, handout. I'm just gonna pull it up right now. You'll see it on Canvas later today. But if you look at these lists, these are lists with page numbers uh, for all of the exercises that are in our textbook, right? So it's gonna have all the self-biofascial release that falls under corrective flexibility on the stabilization uh, checklist, right? It's gonna have all the static stretches in your textbook and all their page numbers. Um, well, you can see here, we've got the core stabilization, balance stabilization, and plyometric stabilization stuff. If you look on the strength exercise checklist, you're gonna see the same thing just for uh, core strength, balance strength, and plyometric strength. Now, we've got these lists kind of put together in stabilization, strength, and power. You know, we kind of put them on three, three handouts like that. The book doesn't do it that way. It'll go like the core section and it'll do like all the stabilization exercises. Then it'll do all the strength exercises. Then it'll do all the power. Then it'll go to balance. Um, so it's, that's why you'll actually, if you look at the page numbers here, right? It's like 235, 235, 236. Uh, and then it like skips way far forward. 577, you know, like that. Um, the reason it skips so far forward is because like all of the rest of the book is in the way, right? But if I look at the strength checklist, you will notice it will pick up uh, right at page, you know, 235 to 236. This will pick up at 237, right? So 237, 238, right? 239. Uh, and then the power checklist will be like 240. 240 through 41. So, uh, so that's kind of cool because you can actually see all those exercises right next to one another. Um, but today we are talking about like how to understand uh, the OPT model and, and what those exercises really mean when we're talking about it, right? Uh, how to kind of recognize them when they, when they come up. So if I pull up our movement prep chart here, right? This is sort of uh, highlighting what we're talking about uh, when we say core balance and reactive, right? So you can see here, if my client's in the stabilization level, they're gonna do all the stabilization stuff. So they're doing core training and they're in the stabilization level. Therefore, we call the core exercises core stabilization exercises. If they're, in the, if they're doing balance exercises in the stabilization level, balance stabilization. Now, if they were doing core in the strength level, we'd call it core strength and if it was core power. So now, We've got a pretty good idea of like how this is all organized. Now all I got to teach is how uh, to memorize which things 
are core stabilization, which things are core strength and which things are core power. So we got to look at like what makes something stabilization, what makes something strength, what makes something power, right? Uh, and that's what we're going to be sort of analyzing today. So uh, there are, like I said, there's going to be three levels to the OPT model, and there's going to be uh, specific exercises that you're going to choose in each one. So if your client's in the stabilization level, that's level one, which means if they're in phase one, you know, um, uh, their exercise selection, we are only going to pick from the core stabilization exercises list. So if I open up that exercise checklist again, um, I can pick any of these exercises. And for the record, you know, Thomas, if you see something on Instagram that you like, or if you just know an exercise that you think is core stabilization, absolutely. But that's not like, those aren't my perfect examples, right? Like the McGill sub, I just mentioned it a minute ago, right? Um, not in the book. Great exercise. I would call it core stabilization because it's all about like holding your spine in place, right? Right. Um, so I'm sure you're, you're thinking right now, you're like, oh yeah, I know a million exercises that, you know, I've seen on the internet or in a YouTube video or I've done, you know, and no, they're not in your book. So how do you incorporate that kind of thing into your workouts? You need to know the defining characteristic. What makes something a core stabilization exercise, you know? Um, so rather than just picking from this list, although that is how we usually do it, you know, just because it's, it's a, again, like when we're teaching stuff, we, we only pick perfect examples, right? Um, how do you spot, you know, how do you know if something's a core stabilization exercise? Well, Here's how you can spot that, right? This sentence right here. It's core exercises that involve little to no movement of the spine and the pelvis. If it's training your core and you don't move your spine, you don't move your pelvis, it's probably a core stabilization exercise. So if I, you know, go to like, um, let's see here. Uh, this guy, Joel Seedman, I talk about him all the time. He's kind of a weirdo. He picks a lot of very unstable, very odd exercises, right? And uh, here's a perfect example of doing something that is very, very goofy looking, <laughs> uh, where he's suspended here. But you'll notice, like, he's just doing a side plank, and he's not, and he's balancing on this band here, but he's not moving his spine and pelvis. So I have no idea what to call this core exercise because it's got so much going on. It's like a banded hip flexed side plank, you know, like, I don't know what I would, Copenhagen chaos side plank apparently is what he calls it. I have no idea why it's called that, but <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the thing. This guy, he gets, he, he gets a little too weird for my taste, but I do love pulling him up because he's got so many, he's very creative. And some of it I love, like you look at something like this, like that's kind of cool, you know? <laughs> right. Um, and actually I think biomechanically, I think really impressive and he's doing single-sided. So it's all very, you know, it's, there's a lot of stabilization that has to happen there. So I would call right. that a chest stabilization actually. Um, so I look at the, you know, I, I yeah, that's not in the book obviously. Uh, <laughs> but I do know that it's a core exercise because it's a side plank and it involves little to no movement of the spine. So I would call it a core stabilization exercise. Um, so that's the rules, right? And so again, you can actually see that in the little chart here. Uh, where did I put that? Come back here. <laughs> right? Core stabilization exercises, ex core exercises that involve little to no movement of the spine. So uh, your planks of the world, your your side planks, your bird dogs, your prone cobras, your supermans, even the floor bridge when you go up and hold and just like stabilize. Like if you do like a, you know, just a floor bridge where you just bring it up and hold and just stabilize right there, that's a core stabilization exercise, right? Um, you can bring it down and reset, you know, and do multiple repetitions, but see how long she's spending in the pause. You know, I would definitely still consider that to be stabilization. So it's not that it always has to be an isometric, uh, although I will say a lot of them are isometrics. Um, you can still do stuff for reps. Um, and that's that's the best way to kind of get that turned on. You know, like even the thing with the, the McGill setup, right? Which I've mentioned a lot, so I need to pull up a video. 
<laughs> so the McGill sit-up or the McGill curl up or whatever you want to call it uh, is basically you take one leg, um, you take one leg and you plant it on the floor and then you're just going to do a little crunch here. Like he's just going to tuck his chin and he's barely going to get his shoulder blades off. And then he's going to go and, you know, hold that for however long he's holding it. And then eventually he'll, he'll, uh, uh, relax that back down. But like, you can see here, he's doing very much like an isometric version. He's holding this for a pretty long period of time. Um, it's sort of like an upside down plank, right? He's working against gravity this way. It's a great, great, great uh, exercise for the transverse abdominis. So I consider that to be one of my favorite core stabilization exercises. I throw that into as many routines as I can actually. Um, so <clears throat> these are exercises that involve little to no movement of the spine. So now uh, when it comes to your acute variables, we got to pick how many reps, how many sets, uh, what's the tempo, how much rest to give our client. So if we open up um, uh, the, uh, if we open this up right here, right? I would pick, you know, from the list. So let's say a prone ISO abs, that's the NASM's big fancy name for the plank, right? Whoops, oh, okay, yeah, it's gonna do that. Uh, Right, prone biceps, and then let's put like a bird dog in there, right? Because that's a really good one for, uh, you know, the sort of posterior chain. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick somewhere between one and four sets. So let's just go in the middle. We'll go with two sets each. Uh, I'm going to pick somewhere between 12 and 20 reps. We'll go right in the middle. We'll go uh, with the prone ISO abs. We'll go 15 reps, which translates, in my opinion, to about 30 seconds because that's an isometric, right? So we'll go 30 seconds there. Uh, and then with the bird dog, we'll do 15 repetitions, which means we'll do, well, we'll do 14 repetitions. We'll do seven on each side, right? Or maybe eight on each side, just to have an, an even number there. Uh, now the tempo here is always gonna be slow unless it is an isometric, in which case like I'm gonna write isometric, uh, but over here I'll put slow, right? Uh, and then I'm going to pick zero to 90 seconds of rest. So I'm going to go with zero seconds of rest here. If I was just doing this, I would maybe go 60 seconds of rest. And that way my client can kind of swap back between the two as sort of a circuit, but, uh, or as a superset. Um, but we're going to fill in these two boxes as we go through the rest of this PowerPoint. So I'm just going to put zero seconds here because we'll come down to this in just a little bit. And that is how I basically use my book and use these charts to kind of fill things out. And those are those numbers you wanna get memorized, right? Uh, you wanna memorize like, you know, which exercises fall into level one, it's core stabilization. What does that mean? It involves little to no movement of the spine. Uh, and then, you know, some of these acute variables here. Honestly, they don't ask you too much about acute variables uh, numbers wise on your test. Um, in the movement prep section. They ask, they ask a lot of number-based questions um, in the resistance section, but they leave it alone for the most part in the, in the movement prep. Um, however, uh, the big thing that they do want you to know is they'll say like, you know, uh, which of the following exercises would be most appropriate for a client in the stabilization level? And let's see, you know, they'll give you four core exercises, right? Let's say one's the prone ISO abs. That's our correct answer, right? Then they'll do one that's sort of like the opposite answer. They'll go with like a, a soccer throw or something. You know, it's a core power. Uh, and then they'll say, uh, you know, stability ball crunch. That's a core strength movement because it moves the spine, right? Uh, and then they'll usually throw like one totally random answer out there. Um, so we know, you know, you need to know, you need to be somewhat familiar with the exercises and then go, okay, look at the exercise and go prone iso abs, not moving the spine. Not moving the spine means core stabilization. See, I did that. And that's sort of what we want to, to run through your brain um, while you're out there <laughs> taking that test. <laughs> uh, and then Thomas, like I said, once you pass the test, break the rules all you want. You know, like <laughs> do what's right for your client. <laughs> Understood. I mean, if I were your client, Right, like if I were your test, you would say like your client is doing barbell squats today. 
which of the following core exercises is most appropriate? And the answer would be the crunch because it's a strength movement. Barbell squats, strength movement. Therefore, the core stuff should be strength movement. That's what's best to pass your test. What's best to train me? <laughs> do the bird dog before you go do your squats. <laughs> um, yeah, I have enough freaking core crunching strength. I don't need any more. <laughs> I'm practically retired from crunches. <laughs> um, all right. So next one we've got, uh, we got to look at the core strength stuff. So now, you know, let's really solidify this pattern here. We talked about core stabilization, right? Those were exercises that involved little to no movement of the spine. Well, what makes something a core strength exercise? Well, it's core exercises that involve a full dynamic, uh, dynamic means movement, concentric and eccentric range of motion. So full range of motion of the spine, right? And we're going to see that definition over here as well. So if your client's in phase two or phase three or phase four, uh, you are going to do core strength exercises. Core exercises involve a full concentric eccentric range of movement of the spine. So, uh, so now what I'm going to do actually is I'm gonna actually gonna change up how I'm making this little chart here. Delete that, delete all that. And now copy that, paste it there and paste that one there. Uh, and this one's gonna be for the power. This one's gonna be for strength. This one's gonna be for stabilization. Just have a little contrast here so it is easy to see. I'm going to unbold these. <laughs> Boop. All right, there we go. So now you can see we got a stabilization version, a strength version, and a power version, right? Um, so uh, we'll leave those, you know, leave this a little bit blank for now, but let's get into the strength stuff, right? So now I said it was core exercise that involve a full dynamic concentric and eccentric range of movement of the spine. Uh, good examples of that are things like cable rotations, right? Cable rotations is grabbing that cable machine, you're rotating, you are moving your spine in, all the way through a plane of motion. The stability ball crunch, yeah, that this is the one that always gets people. It's like this is as close to a trick question as NASA will ever ask you. Uh, but it's like, which of the following exercises is most appropriate for a client in the strength level? And then they'll say stability ball crunch. And you're like, oh, stability ball, that means stabilization. So then you instantly assume that it's not appliable here. Doesn't have anything to do with the name. Doesn't have anything to do with the piece of equipment. What's important is what is the spine doing, right? If the spine's not moving, it's stabilization. If the spine is moving, it's strength. And if the spine's moving fast, it's power, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So we are moving through a full plane of motion with this, with the cable rotations and with the stability ball crunch and with the back extensions, right? Uh, bicycle crunch, whatever, right? So again, I'm going to pick two of these for the core stuff, just because I like to. Um, I'm going to put it here. Oh, that's right. So I'm going to say cable rotations, right? And let's go with the stability ball crunch. Right. Uh, good Lord. And then again, I'm going to pick two to three sets. This time I'm just going to go with two again. Uh, for my reps, uh, for the cable rotations, I'm going to go with eight each. Uh, I know it's a total of 16, but I think that that's going to be a little bit more effective. Uh, for my stability ball crunch, let's go with like 12 of those. Uh, tempo, we're going to go medium, right? So that's a medium 202 tempo. You basically have an even distribution, concentric and eccentric. We'll go zero seconds of rest. Uh, and eventually, you know, we'll rest at the end of our, our little circuit here. So now we've got our, actually, I'll put it over here. We got our core stabilization exercises, right, uh, for both of these. And now we've got our core strength exercises for both of these. What do you think is going to go here? Core power, right? So, um, so that's what we, sorry, I'm getting a Sochi text here, actually. Ah, <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I gotta go help. We got a new uh, we got a new treadmill coming in. Uh, that's exciting. Uh, and you know, who did they call to to lift it? <laughs> Me and Mo. <laughs> um, so uh, that is. Uh, that's going to be our strength level stuff, right? So core strength exercises, anything that really does kind of move your spine. Feeling good? Yep, feeling good. I guess you were serious about the whole moving thing, huh? Yeah, right. <laughs> my buddy, my one of my best friends, my buddy Will, he has a, a pickup truck because he's a pool guy. And when he got it, I was like, man, so many people are going to ask you to move. And sure enough, like the, the, as soon as he got like, it was just like all the time. And so a joke that we have in our friend group is like, whenever we need something and like, you know, we look at Will and we're like, you got a truck, right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, that's the phrase. Like you got a truck, right? <laughs> <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> and I here's the, here's the thing. I've taken advantage of it a million times. He's, you know, like <laughs> I'm part of the problem. <laughs> Ugh. Okay. Um, so looking at the power stuff, uh, you will notice like core power, right? It totally follows the same sort of scheme here, right? So the idea here is all, you know, if it's the power of it, it's all about like concentric and eccentric force production, right? We're just looking at like rate of force production, right? If we talk about like, you know, you start to look at like what the difference between stabilization, strength, and power is. Stabilization is all about learning how to do something. Strength is all about learning how to do that same thing, but for way more weight, force production. And then power is all about rate of force production, right? So you will still see some force production even in power, you know? Um, but it's all about like how quickly you can do it. So we sort of need to find this like perfect blend of the right amount of weight to be able to, you know, increase force production, but also the right amount of weight where we can move explosively. Um, and that's why there's really no one rep max section within the movement prep because, you know, we don't really apply that here. So, uh, when it comes to clients who are in phase five, AKA level three, they're going to pick core power exercises and core power exercises are going to be defined as core exercises that move through a full range of motion at functionally applicable speeds is what like NASA always says. Uh, that means fast. <laughs> functionally applicable just means fast, you know? Uh, and so uh, we are moving our spine through a full range of motion as explosively as we can. Uh, the medicine ball slam is a really good example of this, right? So when you look at a medicine ball slam, you know, it is meant to be a very explosive movement, right? That is, oh my God, that's the laziest throw I've ever seen. Oh, there's a, there's a video about, are you doing it right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this guy's coaching it about like, yeah, don't do it that way. <laughs> um, let's see those slams. So he's gonna pick it up properly. And then, oh my God, are you kidding me? <laughs> that is not... This man and I have very different definitions of the word slam. Slam, right. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I had to go to CrossFit to find good form for this. How embarrassing is that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but that is it, right? That's what we want. We want to see explode, right? He's, cr look at how, you know, he's doing a crunch. That's spinal flexion, right? He's just doing it very, very, very quickly. Um, so medicine ball pullover throws another really good one. Uh, that's actually the one where you're on the stability ball. Uh, you can do this on a bench too, but, uh, the pullover throw is basically this big explosive movement. Um, and his trainer is going to catch and then hopefully throw it back to him. I don't know if he actually will or not. I hope he does it right. <laughs> I freaking hate watching videos on YouTube about exercise so much. Look at this. This video is 52 seconds long. 36 of it was explanation. <laughs> uh, so, he, okay. So that's another thing. He did this. This is something that I completely disagree with. So see how you reloaded him. Uh, so he's going to throw it and then he's going to get it back. He's catching it. He's, he's putting his hands up. He's slowly stretching and then he's doing it again. So here's the motion. What's that? It should be all one motion. Exactly. 
we want when it comes to power so many people do this like slow eccentric loading and then explosive concentric unloading um but we need to have that explosive eccentric lengthening in order to have the explosive concentric shortening i need to load explosively so that i can explode explosively right like um you wouldn't try to get into the nfl by doing a high jump like this and then jump you know what i mean like right, right? like we wouldn't do it that way we wouldn't move at the snail's pace right we want it. you see them do that they go and then they jump right uh, that's what we need to do here, right? So the same thing is true of the stability ball crunch. I'm gonna use my, my bed here as sort of an example. I don't wanna just like catch that ball, get my hands right, and then like, and then crunch, right? That's totally, I'm only doing explosive concentric. I need to get that ball and catch it, let the momentum carry me back and then throw it and catch it. And I need to have this like, fast turnaround from stretch to shorten, right? Um, we are taking advantage of those stretch shortening cycles that I keep mentioning. We need to load, which puts a bunch of tension so that we can unload very quickly. The transition between the two should be as short as possible. Rant over. Uh, <laughs> so many people do power wrong. It drives me crazy. Right. And don't get me wrong, here's a really quick, I will put an asterisk just so I can be fair here, just to put an asterisk. If your client doesn't have proper joint stability, first off, they probably shouldn't be doing this anyways. Um, but yes, like sometimes the loading part, you do want to make sure that like they're doing it properly. So like if in teaching them the explosiveness, you want to go like a little bit slowly because it's safer. Sure, that is still an option, you know, go slow safety is always our first priority um but if we're talking about like training athletes which you know most of the videos we're looking on the internet like that's what it's about um you need to be explosive in both directions you know i don't want to train a footballer who can only move explosively in one way you know <laughs> um we need to be explosive all over uh so let's look at our uh example here so we're gonna pull this let's see what do we got medicine ball pullover throw Uh, and we'll go with the medicine ball rotation chest pass. It's so funny too, like none of this says core stuff in here. <laughs> medicine ball rotation chest pass, but it is a core exercise, right? It's, it's basically an explosive wood chopper. Um, uh, you know what, really quickly I'm gonna do, I am gonna change this. Uh, I'm gonna move this down here. I just realized I could have done a really good job of drawing parallels and I didn't. Uh, we have an opportunity here to really make this extra clear. Uh, I'm going to change the bird dog to a side ISO abs, and we'll go with uh, 15 seconds each. Um, now, here's why I did that, and then that would be an isometric now. <laughs> so now, actually, you can take a look. Imagine if this was a client moving through three months of training, right? We train their transverse abdominus in the front. We train their ex external or internal obliques on both sides. Then we move to the outer levels and we chain their rectus abdominus in the front with the stability ball crunch. And then cable rotations, we move to their external obliques along the sides to develop you know, force production. Then we get the medicine ball pullover throw, which is still for the rectus abdominus in the front, but now it's explosive. And then we went to the rotation chest pass for the external obliques on the side. So you can see we went from like, you know, we did the front and the side of the core. We didn't do any back stuff, although I would totally put that in this box here if I if I wanted to. Um, but we went from the, we went, you know, front and side of everything, but we went from not moving the spine to fully moving the spine to fully moving the spine fast. And uh, we're gonna pick two sets again. Uh, we're going to go with 12 reps on both of those, except this one's single sided, so we'll do that. Uh, tempo is going to be explosive on both of them. And we'll go zero seconds of rest both times. And there we go. We are on to bounce stuff. Any questions? 
no, pretty clear. I love that. All right. So uh, obviously, whenever you're doing core stuff with anybody, uh, watch for dizziness, especially in our senior clients, um, especially if they get up too early. So like crunches, for instance, you're changing like gravity's effect on your blood flow in your actual head, right? Um, so you want to be a little cautious with that, especially if your client has atherosclerosis, blood pressure problems, things like that. In fact, crunches are really not recommended for people who have hypertension problems. I will almost always pick things like wood chops where they can keep their head upright the entire time. It's not so much the side to side stuff that bothers them. It's the up down. If you move their head like that too much, um, a lot of times they'll get dizzy. They'll get like lightheaded. Um, so just watch for that. Just, just be cautious about it. Um, I guarantee you there's going to be a moment in your career where that'll happen and you'll be like, oh, I remember hearing that. <laughs> and then you'll be like, all right, Tim, let's, uh, let's change it up. You know, <laughs> like, um, cause there'll be, you're going to have a client who like, doesn't know they have blood pressure problems. And then all of a sudden they do their crunches and they're going to sit up and they're going to go, Ooh, I'm a little dizzy. And you're like, really? <laughs> um, it'll totally happen. Cause <clears throat> everybody always forgets to put stuff on the park. You like constantly or the medical history questionnaire. It's like, I had a client one time. I <laughs> literally the second day I trained them, uh, cause I usually start upper body. So we get to our first lower body workout and they were like really having trouble on this one exercise. And they're like, Oh yeah, well I, you know, I sprained my ankle like three weeks ago. And I was like, two days ago, two days ago, you and I filled out a waiver and I asked you about any injuries and any surgeries. And you didn't tell me about a sprained ankle from three weeks ago. <laughs> and they're like, I didn't think it was important. I'm like, Oh, <laughs> so annoying um anyway uh so always always watch for that uh watch for muscle cramps too the the fascia in our stomach it does get tight sometimes uh and that's especially true in senior clients so sometimes they'll get like abdominal cramps which don't feel so good uh just encourage them to like hands over the head breathe into their diaphragm that can have a really positive effect um, encourage deliberate breathing so we don't experience any pressure spikes. And then watch for excessive flexion and excessive extension movements. Um, so things like cable crunches, for instance, um, which is a great core strength exercise. Uh, the amount of range of motion of the spine here is, is really like it, it kind of, it really bends the spine <laughs> kind of a lot. Um, just because of the range of motion of it. And so I'm not a huge fan of that. You can say, look at that. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of that with like senior clients, just because excessive flexion can kind of put them in at, at risk there. Same thing with like back extensions. I don't mind back extensions. If my client, you know, uh, like in the drawing here comes up to neutral, that's fine. But if you see them, I can find a picture of someone doing it. This guy's kind of doing it, but it's not quite what I'm looking for. You'll just see people come up like really far. Oh, way, right. Yeah. And it's like, hey, you just don't need to do that. You know, actually, there's another good CrossFit picture. <laughs> this is not a, quite a back extension. This is a glute ham raise, but um, still really good. She's for the most part neutral, right? And she's even got her <laughs> head somewhat tucked, uh, which I'm also a big fan of. Um, yeah, yeah, fair enough. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and talk about the balance stuff. So we're gonna follow the same uh, sort of pattern here, right? Balance, we're gonna define that as how far outside of your base of support you can maintain equilibrium. So it's how far outside of whatever your base of support is. So if I'm standing on one leg like this, that one leg is my base of support. So my balance is how far outside of that I can reach. If I can only go to here, and then all of a sudden I start losing my balance, right? That is not as good as if I could go all the way out to here, right? So that's sort of how we're, we're defining this. Um, the further away, and that's why that uh, star excursion test exists. Uh, you know, that, that balance test where you stand in the center uh, grid here and you reach as far away as you can. Um, that's, that's what's testing. It's testing how far outside of your base of support you can, 
you know, maintain your balance. So what's really great about balance training is it's one of the best ways for us to enhance neuromuscular efficiency, which is this term that just pops up all the time in our textbook. Um, we're going to find that as the ability the, the ability of the nervous system to recruit the right muscle at the right time for the right amount of force in the right plane of motion. And we know that neuromuscular efficiency leads to proprioception. And if we know we have that, guess what? We're going to fall less often. So that's very good. So why does balance training enhance neuromuscular efficiency? Why does it enhance proprioception so well? Because when you think about it, there's so many little like micro movements that have to take place during balance, right? Like if I'm standing like this, right? And I start to shift and lose my balance over here, right? Gravity is now pulling me. And so like, I have to use the right amount of strength to get me back to neutral. Because if I contract too much, I'm totally gonna end up falling the other way. And that's why you see people when they're losing their balance, right? They do this, right? <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, try this much. Nope, that's too much, right? Um, you ever try to like balance? Uh, I actually don't know that I ever have, but I've seen them in cartoons. You know, <laughs> you know those balance uh, scale thingies? Uh, <laughs> well, it is, yeah. You see them in the, the it's like the, the lady in the, the courtroom is holding it up, <laughs> right? And so it's like, you try to add a little bit here and then that causes it to be too heavy. So then you add a little bit to the other side and, like, you know, and then it shifts, right? That's what's happening in our, this is adorable, uh, <laughs> little kid one. It's like, do you really want your kid to grow up to be a lawyer? Uh, <laughs> um, so like, that is that is what's happening. That's giving us proprioception because like, you know, if I told you, oh, hey, Thomas, if this is ever, if this scale is ever tilted this far down, it needs three cubes in the other side. And then you would be like, okay, got it. Logging it away, three cubes, right? that's kind of what your brain's doing when it comes to balance. It goes, oh, how much force do I need to contract this muscle for? Uh, and it remembers from the last time you lost your balance. And so then it contracts for that amount of force. Um, it's like little, in, you know, you're, you're teaching your brain through experience. It experienced this loss of balance. So then it gets better at balancing because it can run that information across past experiences that enhances proprioception your body starts to understand where it is in space because you're giving it so much sensory information uh, the more information we have the more you know the more we can draw upon in our experiences it's how our brain is uh sort of organized right so again, there's going to be three levels here. There's going to be the stabilization level, strength level, and power level, uh, which means if we're doing balance training, we are going to have in this column, balance stabilization, balance strength, and balance power. And we'll talk about what those are. Uh, now, one thing that you are going to do to enhance proprioception and make things harder is you're going to use like a, a specific progression. You're going to progress in the same way that you go from one to two to three to four, or you go from stabilization to strength to power. You know, doesn't matter. We always progress in order. Well, we've got sort of a progression order when it comes to uh, uh, balance uh, pieces of equipment. First, we're going to always start our clients on the floor. No enhanced proprioception there. Just balancing on its own is enough. Um, but then eventually we're going to put them on a balance beam. A balance beam is, you know, that little like two by four that's on the ground. Does that actually challenge your balance? A little, you know, like, like the thing is like, and we're talking about the floor versions here. And by the way, like just make one yourself. <laughs> if your gym doesn't have, most gyms will have them. They can, they, but like, just make it, just go buy a two by four. It's like, <laughs> you know, uh, rather than, cause like these things are, look at 150 bucks. Are you, no, no, you know, <laughs> um, or you can use a two by six if you wanted to, you know, but you're basically just going to enhance proprioception. Uh, that's a, uh, four by four. Um, you're enhancing proprioception, not necessarily by, actually adding any planes of motion or instability or anything like that but it does play with a little bit of like your visual center like your brain's like trying to balance so it's like uh the floor is supposed to be a couple inches lower and so it just kind of plays with your balance a little bit throws you off a little just like one of the other progressions you can even just have your client close their eyes uh and that will sometimes make balance a little harder from there we're going to move into the half foam roller 
a uh, great piece of equipment. You know, I recommend getting a 12 inch version, just like, uh, just like the foam roller itself. Like don't get the three footer, just get the, just get the, you know, one the, the 12 inch one. Um, and you can use this in two ways, you know, uh, uh, let's see here. You know, you can use this uh, in both directions. You can use the this side here, which is now adding, you know, this is the more stable of the two. This is where I usually start my clients. And then as they get really good at it, uh, I'll just flip that over, you know, <clears throat> and go on the rounded side, which is obviously much harder because there's, you know, way less surface area contact. Um, so that's another really great way to sort of enhance that balance there, right? Um, then from there, we're going to move on to an Airx pad. This is a foam pad. Thomas, you got to buy one of these. It is one of the best pieces of equipment that I can tell any new trainer to buy. Um, mostly because, yes, it's good for balance. But honestly, my favorite thing about it is it gives your client something to kneel on when they do like hip flexor stretches. And it gives you something to kneel on when Mo teaches you how to do all that assisted stretching stuff uh, and you've got like eight appointments in a row, you are going to want to have one of these pads. <laughs> to protect those knees. Right. I'm not trying to sound like an old man here, but I, in my 20s, I was like, oh, this is valuable. <laughs> so yeah, and they're 20 bucks or maybe 30 bucks, but I mean, that says 74, but no, yeah, there we go. 20 bucks. Okay. Yeah. Great piece of equipment. Um, and it is also, you know, going to enhance your client's balance if you want to use it for that. It's very versatile. Uh, and then a Dyna disc. <clears throat> this is the little squishy disc that we'll sometimes see, right? So the reason it goes, and this is really hard to balance on, you know, these things are freaking tough. Um, but you're just going to, you know, try to balance on it as, as best you can. This is the most advanced version, right? And the reason for that, the reason it goes in this order is, you know, obviously both of these aren't really adding any planes of motion in terms of instability, but the half foam roller, it either moves through the sagittal plane or the frontal plane, uh, but it doesn't move side to side, any beyond that, right? It's only one plane at a time. And that's why that's the first in the progressive order. Second one's the AirX pad which can, you know, you kind of move a little bit in both, right? You'll like tilt this way and then you'll flip. So there's two planes of motion. And then the Dyna disc is like super dynamic and that moves through like all planes of motion. So that's why it goes in that order. So uh, let's go ahead and take a look at our balance stuff, right? So, you know, we talked about core stabilization as being core exercises that involve little to no movement of the spine. Well, balance stabilization exercises are really similar. They are balance exercises that involve little to no movement, but instead of the spine, we are saying of the balanced leg. So even like a single leg lift and chop, you know, which is like, I've got my leg up, I've got a ball here, I lift and I'm chopping. There's a little bit of spinal movement, just barely, but there's a lot of shoulder movement. There's a lot of movement that's going on there. But what I'm not doing is I'm not moving my balanced leg. The leg that's planted on the ground stays put. Therefore, it's a balanced stabilization exercise, even if it is a lot of movement elsewhere. Um, so that is, uh, that is sort of the difference there. So we look at this here, right? Um, the idea here, the single leg balance with reach is a really good example. Right, single leg balance with reach. I'm standing on one leg. I'm reaching with my opposite leg. Right, uh, that is the single leg balance with reach. I know you might think reach, but that's <laughs> talking about reach with the leg. Um, and that's also a really good uh, balance stabilization exercise. So now we go to our example that we've been kind of building here, and we're going to pick from the list. Right, we're going to look and you know choose the, the correct exercises from the correct list. Uh, do you have a question? I heard you for a second, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I was just uh, saying bless you. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> um, so, oh, God, I keep forgetting. Uh, so we're going to go single leg, lift, and chop. 
right? One to three sets. So I'm going to put two because it's in the middle. Uh, 12 to 20 reps, six to 10 of it's single sided. Here's the thing. It will literally always be single sided. <laughs> it's a balance exercise, right? So it will always be single sided. So we're going to go with six each. Um, actually, we want to go right in the middle. So we'll go with eight each. Uh, tempo is going to be slow again. And we'll put zero seconds of rest. This is going to be a balance stabilization exercises, right? And then over here, we're going to see strength. Uh, and over here, we're going to see power. So um, yeah, balance exercises that don't move the balance leg. So following the pattern that we said last time, right? Um, we talk about the idea of the strength level and it's like, well, we go back and it's like, what makes something a balanced strength movement? These are balance exercises that involve a full range of motion of the balanced leg. So now I'm going to start moving some of my balanced leg joints, right? So even if it was as simple as this, right? Let's say I was standing on one leg and I just did a single leg calf raise. That's moving, my balanced leg is now doing that press, right? Um, I'm moving my ankle joint. That one's actually not in your book. We're going to look for more advanced versions, but that would count as a balanced strength movement. But if we talk about something like a single leg Romanian deadlift, right? Something like this. Whoop. Speaking of balance, uh, <laughs> where I go down and then bring myself back up, right? If I'm doing something like that, I'm moving my hip, my knee, my ankle, right? All of those joints in the balance leg. So that's what makes that balance strength. Balance exercises that involve a full concentric eccentric movement of the balanced leg. Um, so good example of this, like a step up to balance actually, right? Imagine if I had a step and I step onto it and then I bring myself up, but I don't bring my leg. I don't plant it, I just bring it up here, right? That's moving my balance leg. <clears throat> Again, knee flexion, hip flexion, ankle dorsal flexion, right? All of those things are happening. So um, back to our little example here. For this one, let's go, yeah, we'll go step up to balance, right? Two sets, eight to 12 repetitions on this side. It's gonna be each, so we're gonna go with 12 each. Uh, we're gonna go with a medium tempo, and we will go with zero seconds of rest again because we got one more exercise to pick in each of these categories. So then, what if our client's in power? Power is where, unfortunately, the, uh, the definition's a little bit different. Um, uh, <clears throat> oh wait, actually, sorry, I'm thinking of, of yeah, I'm thinking of reactive power. So um, clients who are in the power level, level three, phase five, right? They're gonna get balanced power exercises. These are balance exercises that involve a full range of motion of the balance leg. That's literally the same definition that we just got done saying. <laughs> but again, we're gonna add that at functionally applicable speeds. These are exercises that involve rapid eccentric deceleration, right? So balance exercises, full range of motion of the balance leg, fast. Here's the thing. It's not about how fast you can jump. It's actually about how fast you can land. So when I say rapid, um, actually, I want this in parentheses because that's actually not word for word in the book. Um, so when I say rapid eccentric deceleration, what I mean is you want to land on your balanced leg. You're going to eccentrically decelerate as you're landing and then stabilize your position. So if I did something like, you know, I'm standing on one leg here uh, and then I literally just do like a forward hop and then stabilize, right? Forward hop and then stabilize. That is rapid eccentric deceleration. I'm decelerating as my muscles are lengthening and then I eventually hold. Um, so frontal plane hop with stabilization, same thing I just did, except you know I go side to side. Um, box hop, single leg box hop with stabilization. Uh, you'll notice the word hop, by the way, a lot. Here's, here's uh, something that's not officially mentioned in your book. 
you'll sometimes hear you'll you'll notice the word hop a lot when we're talking about single leg stuff and you'll notice the word jump a lot when we're talking about double leg stuff i don't know if that's an official definition but it has been in my head for years and i use it as a, i think of it when i'm using like i'm speaking um but it doesn't actually explicitly say that anywhere <laughs> but yeah hop up uh Oh, there's a reverse lunge jump to stabilization, but then again, that is double-sided, but you would, um, you know, you would do a reverse lunge and then you would land on one leg, right? So the reverse lunge to jump with stabilization would be something like this, right? I would do like a reverse lunge, leap, and then stabilize before doing my next one, right? And I'm balancing on that one leg. Um, so let's go. Frontal plane hop to stabilization. Two to three sets, we'll go with two. Eight to 12 reps. Uh, yeah, let's go with 12. We've got a 12 scheme going on here. Uh, and then tempo. We're going to say three to five second hold on landing. Okay. Uh, and we'll put zero seconds of rest here. So it's a jumping exercise because it's power, but it's not so much about how high they can jump, it's about how well they can land. And that's really gonna be the priority there. All right, so next thing we gotta talk about is reactive training. So reactive training are sometimes referred to as plyometric training. Um, as another example, I don't know what NASM is gonna use in terms of language. Uh, they use those two terms interchangeably, reactive slash plyometrics. I like the term reactive because it is like when you break down what it is, it's your nervous system reacting to something. Um, but plyo does actually mean explosive, so I don't know. But these are exercises that focus on using that stretch shortening cycle, and they require the neuromuscular system to react to brown reaction forces, right? So when I say stretch shortening cycle, what I mean here is it is a rapid eccentric lengthening that triggers a nervous system to freak out a little bit. So then that triggers a rapid concentric shortening within that muscle. So if I'm trying to contract my chest more explosively, I can do that by rapidly lengthening in the opposite direction. When I do that, my chest, whoa, right? It wants to pull back the other way. That's the stretch shortening cycle. It stretches. Your nervous system freaks out, so then it shortens and it kind of rinses and repeats. So um, all of these are going to involve some version of a stretch shortening cycle. That's why I don't want somebody to catch the ball and then really slowly and lazily and then throw it, right? It's like, no, no, no. Rapid in both directions is what's important here if you're trying to develop maximal power. <clears throat> so you shouldn't be doing these unless your client exhibits good core strength, by the way. Uh, make sure that, you know, they, they can move properly. They should have good core, good balance, and not too many overactive muscles before you ever try to do any of this reactive stuff. And that's obviously very important for senior clients. Uh, but if your client's in stabilization, that's level one slash phase one, they're going to get plyometric or reactive stabilization exercises. So in this section, God dang it. <laughs> if I zoom in more, maybe I can just drag it over. There we go. So in the reactive section, right, they're going to get plyometric stabilization exercises. These are reactive exercises that involve little to no movement upon landing. So again, we see a major pattern here, right? Little to no movement of the spine, little to no movement of the balance leg, little to no movement upon landing. Again, plyometrics really are all about the, the stretch and the shorten. So where does that happen? It happens at the landing. So this is where it's like, yeah, I don't really care about how explosively you can move in the stabilization level. I just want you to learn how to move right. So if I did like a squat jump, we actually do want them to kind of hold their landing, right? I do want them to kind of sit and hold that. And then, right? I do want that pause because I don't care about how high they can jump. I'm just training for the eccentric deceleration right now. I'm only focused on the rapid eccentric part. Um, so uh, we look at our example program here 
and we run it against what we've got over here, we're going to go with the box jump to stabilization. Right? And that's going to be one to three sets. So we'll go with two. Five to eight reps, pretty low here. So I'm just going to go with eight reps on this one. Uh, and then our tempo, we're going to say three to five seconds, hold on landing again. So it's so funny, right? Like, like the balance power stuff looks very similar to the reactive stabilization stuff. The difference is this is always two-legged because it's about the maximum power jumping. And this is always single leg because it's about the balance. We care about the landing mechanics here. We care about the balance up here. So that's where we're going to go with reactive, or we'll go plyometric. Um, stabilization exercises. Here it'll be strength. And down here it'll be power. So um, that's a good example of what we're going for there. Box jump to stabilization, box jump up to stabilization, box jump down to stabilization, doesn't matter, right? Lateral. Uh, what we care about is the landing. Uh, and then if our client's in the power level, okay, now we can start worrying about the jumping, right? Now we can start worrying about like, yeah, let's try to increase our, you know, full range of motion. Let's see if we can get full movement and let's see if we can start to transition from stretch to shorten. So these are reactive exercises that move through a full range of motion at a repeating tempo. So that repeating tempo is actually really important here. We do want them to kind of stretch and then shorten. So now, rather than doing a box, uh, let's say a squat jump to stabilization where, you know, I hold, now I'm like, I'm trying to like bounce from one end to the next, bounce from one end to the next. I'm trying to stretch, shorten, stretch, shorten, stretch, shorten, right? So just like that, that's a repeating tempo. You get a little bit of a rhythm to it, right? Uh, and that's really going to allow me to like, you know, explode. Um, so looking at this, uh, you know what? I'm actually going to change this from box jump to stable. I'm going to change it to squat jump to stabilization. And then over here, we're going to go repeat squat jumps. That way we sort of have a parallel from one to the next. So again, uh, two to three sets. So we'll go with two, eight to 10 reps. Let's just go with 10 here. Uh, and we're going to put repeating on our tempo. Oh, I forgot to do rest last time. And since we're finally at the end here, We'll go 90 seconds of rest. Here we'll go 60 seconds of rest. Um, so that's that's sort of our routine, right? Repeat squat jumps. And now we've got sort of a circuit. Now we've got a really good movement prep section. I've got some muscles turned on before I ever get to my workout. My clients worked up a little bit of a sweat, but it's not like maximum intensity or anything like that. Um, Actually, I should have said that at the end of this next section. So we got to do the power level. <laughs> um, so reactive power, which is so funny because it's like plyometric power. It's like power plus power. Um, so this is all about like reactive joint stabilization. This is super, 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 super explosive at the fastest speeds possible. So this is very, very, very advanced. Uh, but things like power step ups, right? Good example here. And you'll notice what she's doing is she's rapidly moving from one to the next. A lot of these exercises do involve uh, uh, explosive ice skaters. I always have a hard time finding a good example of this because they're always so slow. <laughs> there we go. So here you can see, boom, she's going as fast as she can from one to the next. A lot of the plyometric power stuff, it involves like moving explosively. And the faster you do one rep, the faster you can do your next rep. 
High knees is a really good example, right? Where it's like, they're basically doing like fast feet. The faster I do my left side, the more quickly I can do my right side. Uh, that's a full ad. This better be a really high quality video if you're giving me a full ad. <laughs> Yeah, eh, not bad. So, right, you can see she's, she's kind of moving back and forth between each of those. So, um, so these are, plyo so if your client's in level three, phase five, they're gonna get plyometric power exercises. These are reactive exercises that utilize maximum force production, full range of motion uh, as fast as possible. So um, that's really the, the big thing we're looking for when we're doing this. So we go back to our client here. Let's go with those uh, power step ups. That's a good one. Uh, two sets, because it's between two and three. Eight to 12 reps go with uh, 10 each. Uh, well, no, we got a whole bunch of 12s here. We'll go 12 each. <laughs> and then we will do uh, tempo. We're going to go, uh, I sometimes write AFAP for as fast as possible, but we would just say um, uh, explosive, or we would say XXX. All of those actually work just fine. Uh, and then we're gonna say uh, 60 seconds of rest there. So now you can see we built three months uh, of movement prep that kind of progresses on itself, right? Um, now, the one thing I didn't do is I didn't base it on my clients overactive, underactive muscles. So let's go ahead and take a look at Bob. Um, actually, you know what, before we get to Bob, let me wrap up the PowerPoint here. So uh, when it comes to safety guidelines for all this stuff, especially with senior clients, always start with the sagittal plane. It's just a little bit gentler, you know? Um, it's where we are mostly used to moving through. Then you can move in the frontal plane, then the transverse. Um, be a little bit cautious with your senior clients when they're stepping backwards. Uh, a lot of these balance exercises, you really wanna be there to spot them. Um, you know, you don't ever wanna have a client fall on you. Always have balance assistance available. Uh, and then you can decrease the amplitude. A lot of times, like, you know, people are like, oh, you wouldn't do plyometrics with a senior client. I'm like, yeah, if they can handle it. Um, now, obviously, I won't do it if I won't make them jump super, super high if they have arthritis, you know. Um, but yeah, they can do little tiny hops because I'm gonna, I, I care about their ankle knowing how to land. And what if my senior client misses the curb? They step off too far and all of a sudden they have to like catch themselves. I want them to know how to be able to do it, you know? Um, so summarizing everything up, we do know that falls are very, a big deal to our senior clients. They're a big concern. They cost a lot, um, you know, uh, but core balance and reactive training can be really good for that. Sometimes this will be your full routine for senior clients. You know, it'll be all core, all balance, all reactive stuff. And honestly, a lot of times, Reactive stuff doesn't even make it into the routines. There'll be a lot of core and a lot of balance, you know? Um, but that is very, very, very good for your clients. It has a very positive effect on, you know, uh, their, their fall risk and stuff. And that's really what we're trying to, to affect here. Um, so let's take a look at Bob. What do we put for Bob? We're gonna progress Bob through his three, his three months, right? So... So you'll notice we kept our warm up from last time. I took out the, the, the cardio section because this isn't a full cardio routine. And Bob, uh, we decided to go with one exercise each. So his movement prep's a little bit shorter. Uh, and we went with the prone ISO abs, which makes a lot of sense for Bob because Bob has that tight hip flexor and erector spinae, right? So those are his two main big downfall. So we're focusing primarily on his stabilization core system rather than stuff that involves like a lot of movement. You know what I mean? And I'm not doing prone ISO abs because that would only make the low back stuff even worse. I'm trying to get away from his low back and, and move towards the front of things. Then we went with the single leg balance with reach. You'll notice I put special emphasis on the frontal and the transverse planes here. We're not trying to let Bob you know, go with the single leg balance to reach where his reach is this way, that's hip flexion. And he has tight hip flexors. So I need to avoid that. I'm just gonna have him do this version here to the side, right? Looks pretty similar to the routine we did the other night, right? Um, 
And then we did a transverse squat jump to stabilization. So, so he's doing a little spin. Uh, and that's going to be his reactive movement. Uh, and he's just doing three reps on each side. So that's a six total. And he's going to do a three second hold instead of a five seconds, three to five seconds, right? So that's pretty gentle for Bob. A um, little bit of a jumping movement, you know, but nothing dangerous. Now, this is where we start to get into a little bit of fiction here. <laughs> uh, we're going to move Bob into the strength level and then eventually move him into the power level. Eventually, this all be, you know, that becomes a little fictional <laughs> for some senior clients. But, you know, again, I'm here to teach you how to look at the book. Oh, Thomas, I lost you. Oh, no. <laughs> I think my recording is still going. Oh no, is my internet down? Oh, my internet is up. Oh, it is still recording. All right, well, that's embarrassing. We're gonna give Thomas a second here. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not sure what, I'm not sure what happened, but uh, I got disconnected. Oh, don't even sweat. I mean, it's, it's raining today, so I know that the internet's going to be all messed up. <laughs> okay. LA is not ready for rain ever. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we're getting hit out this way, too. All right. Um, all right. So we're moving Bob into his strength month here. Um, and again, warm up is the same, except we moved into all the active versions. And again, we're putting emphasis on the front of his abs instead of the back. We're putting emphasis on uh, his glutes instead of his hip flexors, right? So we went with the stability ball crunch because, yeah, that's, you know, that's in the front of things. That's going to hopefully have a positive effect on, you know, leaving his low back alone. Then we're going to go with the single leg RDL, that single leg Romanian deadlift, which is pure hip extension, right? As my client goes down, right? And then uh, they're going to bring themselves uh, it's a big glute exercise, which we need because his hip flexors are so tight. So we go with the single leg RDL. And then we went with the re repeat transverse squat jump, which is simply a progression from our first month. So instead of like holding and holding, now he's going to do a little bit of a repeat. So he's going to side to side. Um, and then for his third month, we moved Bob. Like I said, this is going to get into the realm of fiction here. <laughs> Remember, Bob was, what, 65 years old? <laughs> um, but let's just say he's a 65-year-old, you know, master athlete, right? Uh, well, now he's going to do the medicine ball pullover throw, right? He's going to get the ball. He's going to be explosive. Uh, he's going to do the single leg RDL jump to stabilization. So that's the one I did earlier where I'm basically going to go, you know, like so worried about this. Uh, so I'm going to go into an RDL and then and land. And then reset and then land, right? Uh, and then lastly, proprioceptive plyometrics, which is what it's called in your book. Um, it's kind of a silly name. But basically, you put a cone on the ground, and your client uh, does this. Front, back, side, side. Front, back, side, side. Um, and you jump over a cone. <laughs> Why is it called that? I don't know. <laughs> Just the name they came up with. <laughs> so that is uh, sort of three months, right? Uh, Every version, we went from, you know, core stabilization, balance stabilization, and, you know, reactive stabilization. And then we went into strength versions of all those. And we went into power versions of all those. Uh, how are you feeling, Thomas? Any questions? Uh, feeling pretty good. Cool. Feeling pretty uh, good. No questions uh, as of right now. Love that. All right, man. Well, we are wrapped up. And uh, yeah, I'll uh, I'll chat with you tomorrow. Alrighty. I did. I'll see ya. All right, now you have a good one. You too. Stay dry out there.
will do likewise. 